This is the Tame Aperture Podcast. Open the pod bay doors, please, Hal. Hello, Hal, do you read me? Do you read me, Hal? Do you read me, Hal? Affirmative, Dave. I read you. I read you. I read you. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. Come on down and jump some of this shit. I'll always have that. Sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. Welcome to the Tame Aperture Podcast, where we talk all things movies from first-time directors, indie films, art house, and much, much more. Today on the podcast, we talk the 2007 anthology film, Trick or Treat, written and directed by Michael Dougherty. Five interwoven stories that occur on the same block on the same night. A couple finds what happens when they blow a jack-o'-lantern out before midnight. A high school principal has a secret life as a serial killer. A college virgin might not have met the right guy for her. A group of mean teens play a prank that they take way too far, and a hermit is visited by a special trick-or-treater. I'm Gabe Vinadal, filmmaker, film instructor, and movie enthusiast, and I'm joined by veteran podcaster and editor Alan Martindale, along with special guest Brandon Richardson. Alan, Brandon, how the hell are you? I'm great. It's it's Halloween time, baby. The best time of year. Uh, This is a perfect movie to watch, too. Yeah, just went through, got back from San Diego, and uh, this neighborhood, it was a closed gate community where we were doing the filming, and like almost every every house in it, to the nines, decorated for Halloween. It was awesome. Love it. And it's in that particular neighborhood. Now, had you watched this movie before or after you went on this gig? Both, because we were gonna, and then we didn't. And so I watched it again. Today. So you watched it twice. Okay. Okay. Good. The third watching, to be completely honest. So you've seen it before? I saw this film years ago. Okay. So, so not to not to spoil the, your whole all your opinions, but were you happy to rewatch it? No, that's I mean, a no. That's probably, a no. That's a yes, that's a definite no. Once I got back into it, I, I was like, oh yeah, I kind of like this film. So yeah. I was happy we, to work. Here, here's what's here's what's ironic about the whole situation. We we brought Brandon back on, or he has graciously decided to come back on during horror month. Brandon doesn't like horror movies. <laughs> it's just so perfect. It's so you know no Brandon. It's not that he doesn't like horror movies. It's like it's that he doesn't like fun. I think that's what it is. I figured it out. What he doesn't like he doesn't fun. like fun. <laughs> Brandon, do you like fun? Sometimes, <laughs> it, no, but it, it honestly it is good because, uh, like last year and the year before, like Gabe, you and I kind of have a similar uh, viewpoint about horror. Yeah, and we both we both love it. We both enjoy yeah. it. So it is fun to have a dissenting voice among it's us. It's true. Who can kind of take us down? You're absolutely right. Which is, it's good to have a, a dissenting viewpoint. Someone who's not as maybe in love with horror as the two of us, because mostly. We'll just clamor about how great it is. Yeah. So, or but the genre itself, like there are movies that I don't like, but the genre is fun. I'm I'm all about the genre. So, in this movie, I I chose this movie because first of all, it's a perfect Halloween movie. Second of all, it knows what it is. It doesn't take itself too seriously. It's not too dark. Third, there are so many fun practical gore effects in this thing. Not just gore, but just in general, the practical effects kind of harken back to the 80s. And so it's just a fun movie. So yeah. that's why I'm, I was really, the whole time I'm watching this, I'm like, I think filmmaking wise, Brandon will appreciate it because there's a lot that goes into it. And they did a lot of really cool in-camera stuff that was really fun. But I, as a, a movie in general, I was very curious to know if he thought it was fun. Now, as I just yeah, don't, yeah, yeah. let's hear it. Um, no, don't say anything and just stand there still during a podcast <laughs> with my thumb in my orifice. Um, I actually enjoyed the film. Yes, I, really did. I, found I, I, did. I enjoyed it. Movie he loves, maybe not loves, but oh, good lord, not love. But no, come I on, enjoyed. Brandon, let's get some excitement. Let's be honest. This movie is super fun. 
Oh, it, okay. It was a hell of a lot better than uh, Camp Sleep a Dork, whatever it was called. I can't Hold remember. on now. Now we're making comparison. We're comparing oranges and apples. See, you got to have an understanding about what the horror genre is. Alan, fill him in. <laughs> How much time you got? I'm, I, what I'm saying is you can't, we can't compare those. We're talking about, you can't compare Friday the 13th that. to this. They're totally different things. But you know you loved Sleepaway Camp in, in the back of your mind. And you know you've talked to, here's the deal. You know the movie has, it resonates in some way or has stuck to you in some way when you go talk to someone else about it. So between the time you watched it and today, have you talked to anybody else about Sleepaway Camp? I did yell at someone calling him a cocksucker. Does that count? <laughs> a- absolutely. That is a perfect dialogue for that movie. <laughs> I remember. So the reason I say that is because I went out with a buddy of mine, uh, with a couple, me and my wife, went to a movie. We actually went. We were going to try to. We forgot that Halloween Kills doesn't come out till next week. Mm. Uh, and so we were originally like, "Oh, let's go to Halloween Kills." And for some reason, I thought it was this Friday, this last Friday. It's not. So we went to Bond, James Bond. We won't get into that. But while we were at dinner, twenty minute conversation on Sleepaway Camp with <laughs> my, my buddy. Yes. Because and and I'm telling him about it. He's like, "That's." He's like, "Wait a minute." I think I've seen that before. <laughs> he's, like, he's, he's like our age. He's 40. He's like, I think I've seen that before. I'm like, yeah, the dude, at because we ended up talking about Ace Ventura, right? Which was like the Finkel Einhorn. And he's like, oh, I swear I've seen that movie. She has a penis at the end. Yep. <laughs> That's the you only can't... part of the movie anyone remembers is, is the ending. Well, and the, the witty dialogue that you just aforementioned. It's amazing, just beautifully written dialogue. But the, the point is, like, you can't, you can't, I don't think you can compare them. I mean, I agree with you, Brandon. If I had, <laughs> if I had a choice, I would definitely watch Trick or Treat again. I probably wouldn't watch so much Sleepaway Camp again. I would watch it again, but not in repeated fashion. If I had to watch a movie, it'd be this one. If I had to compare the two, if I had to continue, if someone put a gun to my head and said, watch one of these two movies over and over and over again, it's a no brainer. I'm going to watch Trick or Treat. Sure. In, that, in that scenario. Uh, I was just plainly mentioning that they're kind of two different things. The thing about Trick or Treat is though it's so highly produced, right? It's, it's just, beautiful. It's, it's, it's well made. Like the, it's, it's not a, and this is the part of the genre that I wanted to get into and maybe Alan will clarify his expertise, which is I kind of appreciated Trick or Treat for being, albeit the studio, well lit, well filmed, technically made movie the Spielberg-esque kind of camera movement, just the way it's put together. It's not a ton of POV. There is few POVs, but it's not a ton of shaky POVs with underexposed or overexposed film. You know what I mean? It's not that 70s, 80s vibe. It's like, this is a well-produced, well-put-together horror film, movie. Not not all horror has to be grit. Yes. No grittiness in this. And normally that kind of turns me off a little bit, but it's just it knows what it is it doesn't bullshit you it, it's like th- we're just gonna have some fun with this thing and i think uh it's really helped with the way it's it's cut together and tied together with the non-linear fashion where mm-hmm. you're seeing things at certain times and they tie together later on like i think that really helps it too and also having a couple twists in there because there are a lot of genre anthology films out there and they're all kind of the same thing where you know what's going to happen. Like someone's an asshole and then they're going to get their comeuppance at the end of the story. And then we'll move on to the next story. And there's not a whole lot to it. And it gets a little boring. But with this, there's some twists in there. And I like how they string together the stories throughout the entire film. So we're with these guys for a little bit. And then we cut away to another story. And then we cut back to the first story. To me, like this movie, I don't think it's nearly as good if it's not put together this way. Yeah, and originally when you had said this was like an anthology, I re- actually what's funny is rewatching it, I remember seeing bits of it. I actually don't remember seeing the whole movie, but I particularly it was like on TV, like either HBO or com- uh, comedy um, USA. It was on something, right? The bus scene, the massacre. I remember seeing this somewhere in the past. If I track backwards, I mean I haven't really seen the movie. I would you know, position myself in that I've never seen it, but something stuck out about that. And, and, uh, and, and I, when you said it was an anthology, I thought, Ew. yeah, yeah, 
that's going to be tough. I thought, I don't know how I feel. Those are, it's tough to tie together um, pieces of writing. You know what I mean? It's tough to tie together and make those transitions work um, and make them work and feel in a way, not in story, but just seamlessly intertwined in the way that they are. I mean, I feel like that's a challenge. And I think in this movie, uh, really, really well played out, which is, you know, I'll give an example of one of the scenes that I, that I enjoyed, which was it's modern times. The, 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 the teenage kids are taking the other kids to the, the, where the bus massacre was. So it's present day. And then while she's on top of the, the hill, they're getting ready to go down. It does a cut and the whole color changes in the film. One's blue and it's modern day. And then the leaves fall and all that stuff happens. And the leaves, the transition falls to the autumn and it's in the seventies, the tie together. So the writing's good too, but also the technical transitions between the stories. I think he did really well. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's, it's just so skillfully done and you don't see this kind of thoughtfulness with a lot of horror. Um, and and, and and I'm saying this as someone who is obsessed with horror. Like it's my favorite genre. I love it. It's what got me into film. It's what got, what what drove my love of filmmaking. So, but with that said, it's still like a lot of the time it's kind of thrown together for shock value or to to make you feel kind of gross uh, or just you know let's just show the gore and and story kind of comes second. But this is just so thoughtfully put together. It's obviously made by someone who loves horror. There's a lot of homage, there's a lot of nods, a lot of Easter eggs in there, but it's also someone who loves the art of filmmaking, I think. And it, it's really, it's really well done. I really, I, it's just so fun. Yeah. And with that, I had to, I had to go, who is this guy? Who's Michael uh, Doherty? Like, who is he? What has he done? And so I went in there because it's very easy to go writer. He's got a, and director. Um, he did more recently a big film which is godzilla king of monsters and ironically enough i've seen that film because my son loves the godzilla franchise stuff and i watched it with him and 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 it, king of monsters is a kick-ass film it's fun it also knows what it is though it's like i'm a blockbuster i'm a big movie and i'm not trying to be anything different i'm not going to try to one thing you'll see a lot of times not a lot but once in a while you'll see these big blockbusters try to throw in things that they're not like try to be something subtextually different than they are. And Godzilla King of Monsters wasn't that. So I'm thinking, and then Krampus, he did Krampus. Did you see Krampus? Seen, I haven't seen that, but I've heard, I've actually, it looks so stupid to me, but I've actually heard good things about it. I have too, and I haven't, I haven't actually seen it. He also was a, he's a big writer in the X-Men series. Um, and then Godzilla vs. Vers Kong and some of the other ones. Awful. That movie sucked. Godzilla vs. Kong was, that's where it dropped the ball. Yeah. That if you awesome. watch King of Monsters, it's a good movie. Then I watched Godzilla vs. Kong, and I was like, get out of here. He so it's, 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 he didn't direct that one, did he? He just wrote no, it. No, he wrote it. He wrote it. And, and so that's actually a good point, Brandon. I think that if you're looking, because I had to find out who this guy was. Okay, he can write. I think he's a good writer. Obviously, Trick or Treat is an example of that. Writing an anthology is no, it's a challenge. That's hard to intertwine, and we talked about that. But directorially, he's good, too, because I think I agree with Alan, Godzilla vs. Kong was a shit show and Godzilla King of Monsters was great, but he directed that movie. So there's something to be said here about being able to take what's on the paper and make it, make it, you know, the live action come together. And I think he does that really well in, in trick or treat as well. Well, and there are, and I, I didn't even know this, but there are, I don't know if they're short film spinoffs or what they are. Yeah, there's some short film spinoffs. And I, I wish I would have known that, but I would have watched them uh, to this movie to trick or treat. Trick or Treat Making Friends and Trick or Treat Father's Day. And then they're going to do Trick or Treat 2, which I just read on IMDb. So I'm super excited. But I'm also a little skeptical because it's hard to recapture the magic. I, I, and usually it doesn't work out very well when you come back to. Here's um, where I agree with you. And here's where you have to. And I don't know for sure. Sometimes people make it work. Sometimes they don't. This is where you can't just set up a repeat of the previous version. You have to go. This is where we were just talking about how you can't in a blockbuster. You don't really want to go too far off the page. In this case, with a sequel of the, you got to go somewhere totally different. I think. I think so too. I mean, obviously they're going to have Sam, the little monster kid, because he's kind of the thread that that ties everything together. Um, 
But other than that, yeah, I, I kind of agree with that. Otherwise, you get Dumb and Dumber 2, which was one of the worst movies I've ever watched in my entire life. Well, the other thing is, if you look at like a Mike Flanagan, who just finished Midnight Mass, I mean, he's using some of the same stuff, but Midnight Mass is a big step away from uh, the Hunting of Hill House, for example. And I love them both for different reasons. So you can do it. Yeah, you can. It it's... kind of follows that. Um, if uh, what's the other guy's name? I'm terrible. Um, Darty, the guy that Darty, this yeah. Film? yeah. If he he follows that kind of that, you know, uses feelings and emotions and and that sort of thing from the original one, but then takes it in a different direction, he could be successful. Um, did you watch the little short animated film that he did that this was all based on? No. Yeah, he he. It was this whole like the little pumpkin head dude. He was he did like a short animated film. You can find it on YouTube. I, I'm gonna have to check it out. I, I didn't realize that the trick or treat universe was so expansive. <laughs> yeah, there's also a um, Universal Studios has like taken it into their mm -hmm. Halloween horror nights or whatever they have, and there's a section with the trick or treat horror stuff, like the characters. So it's like it's a it's grown beyond just the movie itself and I, you can see why i think just because the movie's so well played out and fun that well, it makes sense every year i would like i love it i love the spirit halloween stores like they're super fun like that that's what gets me into halloween and um so every year i would go in there and i'd see all the trick-or-treat stuff like because they have a licensing deal with with it or whatever and i i was always like man that looks so stupid because it's just an anthology film and it's dumb. But a couple of years ago, I actually watched and I'm like, okay, I get it. This is a great movie. So <laughs> is that, I have questions on the characters. And per, primarily you said it's, it's, it's Sam, right? The pumpkin head? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The little, or the, I should say the scarecrow pumpkin head. He's got like yeah. the scarecrow burlap sack. Yeah. Little kid thing. What's his representation? Is he just representing the holiday? Like Halloween? Is I guess. the idea? I, I am a puppet master. I felt like he was a little bit for sure. Like a puppet master. I, I started to kind of, but he was punishing people for not celebrating the holiday. Right. Because or, or respecting how it, sh it should be celebrated. I think it's, there's something with the pumpkins, but not everybody who gets killed in this movie blew out a pumpkin. You know, that's, that seemed like it was kind of the, the threat. So I started thinking about that and I was like, okay, so what does he represent? What is this all about? And then I'm like, no, dude, that's stupid. This movie's not meant to be overanalyzed. Like it's it's just meant to be fun and dumb, yeah, and, and, a, and a good time. And so I kind of forced myself to stop overthinking it. <laughs> okay, let's end the podcast. Good, good job, everybody. Yeah, good job. Let's give our scores. Go watch Trick or Treat. Let's jump right into ratings. Um, <laughs> Alan, what you got for this film? But on the other hand, I know Brandon was probably analyzing it because I know he's, he's got an inquisitive mind. He likes to break down film. So yeah. I'm, you were to an extent, right? I was. And, and to, to kind of piggyback why I enjoyed this film more is probably the reason, well, you, you enjoyed this film too, but I don't really like the grit and the shaky cam of all of that stuff of horror films is which I generally don't enjoy them, but because this one was so well produced and because it was in a word cleaner, I guess you could say I enjoyed it more and and I guess I just kind of the artistry of what they were doing and again the practical effects were fantastic I was pleasantly pleased that a 2007 film did not heavily rely on CGI there's a little bit but I mean but just I really really enjoyed that aspect of it and I was like okay nice um, yeah Brandon can you put your uh, ascot on with a cigar and go <laughs> I can. with a cigar I, I'm just kidding I'm giving you a hard time I know what you're saying which is yeah we talk it's, it's the it, I call it the Hollywoodized format it's clean yeah. you mentioned it I agree and I loved the score by the way yeah I thought the score was fantastic it was it was a big part of my, me enjoying the film was how well that score was done and I wasn't familiar with that composer before. I I never. I assumed it was um, Brian Singer's. Oh, what's his name? I can't think of it now. What well, can we can we talk about Brian Singer producing this because he's been under a lot of hot like, water. Yeah, I saw Bad Hat Harry. I was like, oh, interesting. I had no idea. 
He's a he's a miniature Harvey Weinstein is what is yeah. what's it's what's gone around the 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 rumor mill. Yeah. He, yeah, he hasn't touched anything for a while since then. Since I think that came, he was I think he was pre Harvey Weinstein just by. Yeah, like it that. seems like it seems like the Brian Singer stuff has been out for a long time. Yeah, and I think it seems like he kind of went away unscathed, which is yeah. It's probably, you know, depending, I don't know all the details, so I'm not really going to speculate on it. I just don't know. I haven't followed it. I just right. know that he was under a lot of pressure and a lot of accusations. Exactly. Tell me your favorite story. You got five stories here. My favorite's the principal. I, I, I loved the principal. Like, I don't know if he's like, because his story kind of intertwines. So it's hard to say that he has a specific story, but I thought the performance of the actor was fantastic. Oh, side note, I do have a very remote professional uh, connection with the fat kid that pukes everywhere. The fat kid from Bad Santa. Yeah. From Bad Santa. Yep. He, he Another classic I, in the Tame Aperture yep. portfolio. Yeah. He Holiday I classic. Shared, Bad he Santa. He a scene in his Christmas movie, Unaccompanied Minors. <clears throat> you, you shared a what? A scene. I was background for his scene. In, How were you? Minors. Yeah. So. Unac is that a good movie? I don't even know. Oh, it's horrible. It's it's it's, it's a terrible. Disney movie. The Disney movie. Oh, is it? Okay. About a bunch of kids running around in an airport, also known as the Sandy Expo Center, which is slash airport. also an additional. I think they also filmed at the library downtown. Yes, they did. Um, so, anyway, basically, uh, Brandon has worked with the kid from Bad Santa. Yes. Kid from Bad Santa obviously worked with Billy Bob Thornton, so basically you're you're tight with Billy Bob. You're you're right there. Just Brandon's the property. You need yeah. to get him on the podcast then. Yeah, let's, I'll, let's I'll bring Billy that. Bob on. Yeah, if you would, that'd be great. We'll talk. We'll uh, we'll give him two months' notice. We'll do Bad Santa two. Let's go. Yeah, and by the way, that movie is. I mean, we we did this last Christmas, and we kind of we kind of messed it up a little bit because we watched two different cuts, but. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> That, that uh, the, uh, the extended cut one, I can't remember if it's the directors, the producers. No, it's not the directors. It's, it's the theatrical one, I think. Is, um, it's, so, it's one of my favorite movies. It's so good. It's just so good. Billy Bob is such, a, is such an awesome douchebag. Yeah, he's a great asshole. He's great. He's great. Yeah. Anyway. So, Alan, let's go back to Trick or Treat. Tell me, yeah, your, yeah. you got Brandon says the principal is his favorite storyline. Which is the ser He's a serial killer. You just there's there's uh and and by the way, he, they decapitate the bad Santa kid's head and they rotate it on a on a on a plate, which is fun. <laughs> so, uh, and I actually like how sinister that character is and how unassuming he is. Like you 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 know that he's a little creepy, but mm -hmm. when the bad Santa kid comes to the porch and steals the candy. And the, the, the principal catches him and then the sits him down and kind of starts talking to him. It's uh, you're a little bit, you're a little bit unaware, like, okay, he maybe just trying to be nice to this neighbor kid who has no friends. Yeah. And then within seconds, he's ate the candy that he gave him and he's just bar. And that scene where he just barfs all over the porch is awesome. It's oh, okay. exorcist style, exorcist style. Well, I mean, props to, <laughs> yeah, right? props to, uh, to Dylan Baker in that role because he's so, so unreal. You would never just knowing him and all the roles he's played and the way he looks and he's like he just looks like a, a straight lace button down regular suburban dad. You know, like you would never expect that twist with him, no. and it, that's why it's so fun. And then and then the added twist later on when he's teaching his kid how to be a killer, like that was fun too because you think he's going to murder the son, but instead. He, he did. He pulled the knife back, and there was blood, and like, there's no one else there. Like, exactly. Dead. And, and this goes back to directing. It was just a great directed scene, which throws you in one direction, thinking the storyline's going here, and then in a quick flash of an edit, it redirects the whole thing. It's just, it's really, it's really nicely put together. And I love that it does that throughout the whole movie. Like yeah. I, I, it's fun to, and if you go back and rewatch it, there are a lot of things you you pick up knowing what the story actually how it unfolds throughout the whole film there's like little little tidbits here and there that you pick up that you're like oh i get it now like, like right at the beginning like um when she's looking across the street the first victim you can see the bus kids going up to that other oh, house you can you can yeah. oh i gotta rewatch yeah. it that's so cool 
because that like that one dude's like kind of standing there creepy it shows yeah. him twice on the first showing of him you can see the bus kids with their like all demented you know bunny ears and shit going up oh, like, that's oh. a cool. see i liked it my favorite storyline uh was the werewolf girls yeah why i uh, just i mean if you if you go back and you listen to the dialogue that they oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. the whole time it's all hinting that they're that they're some sort of monster run to the litter yeah. run to the litter and they're like oh i ate some bad mexican <laughs> like, yeah i you know, just like it's it's really really good and See, I just, being the first time watch i was unsure i didn't know and i wasn't paying attention to the subtext in the in the dialogue right right, right and right. so i if you were to go what was the most uh, un uh unaware or the sh uh, not shocking i guess maybe shocking of, of them all was like was that one for me because i had no idea for a minute until they got to the the party in the woods where the bonfire was for a minute i, I thought they were vampires that's what i thought too i did too and I, then I, I, I was like they're vampires okay cool and then all of a sudden they start transforming into complete werewolves and i'm like whoa i didn't I, for me on the first view i was like oh i didn't see that coming I didn't, yeah. I wasn't paying attention to those hints that you were just talking to, which was cool. That's why that's my favorite story because the, uh, just the twist, like you think you got to figure it out and then they throw another twist in there. Yeah. Another little something right. that, that throws it another direction. And that see in a movie like this, it almost feels like that has to be, you got it. You have to have that in your strategy, right? It's like, we got to like play you down the one road and then do a quick shift over so that's why once again, we talk about that writing and the story development of the anthology is so cool because you only have, if you were to take each of these stories and there's five of them and you, I mean, they're, they're basically what, 15 minutes long by themselves, 15, 20 minutes long by themselves. So you don't have a lot of time to unfold those stories. And right. so you have to do these quick turns, quick plot twist things that kind of redirect and refocus and make it fun. And once again, I keep saying it, but I think that's what he does really well is really yeah. well done. Well, and then just sure, the, yeah. the practical effects of, of the werewolf transformation. Awesome. So cool. Those werewolves look so cool. It just, it was, it's like how I would, when you go back and watch old eighties horror movies and the practical effects, they're cool, but it's not as cool as it would be modern day. And like we always, as horror fans are always screaming and crying that less CGI, more practical. And this is right. why it looks so freaking cool. But as far as filmmaking wise, my favorite, story is the bus massacre one mm -hmm. i just think the way that whole story <clears throat> is shot from the flashback to the bus going over the the quarry to the the when they're down below by the little pond or swamp or whatever it is just the way it's it's so creepy and so scary and the the jack-o-lanterns are going out and the lights are it's just it's really cool it's really well done and that's that 70s vibe so there is a little throwback to those those right horror naturalists like yourself people who like the 70s 80s types horror films like it has that eight that 70s vibe to it you know right. just the way it's filmed the coloration even the masks and the design of the costumes is like very kind of 70s you know yeah exactly sound, sound design note that sound design of that bus going over the edge and that whole was spectacular because of the lack of sound i thought that was a, a fantastic choice to just have that bus go over and just because you can feel you can feel it free falling yeah yeah that, you, you that just was... didn't want you didn't want a bunch of chunky audio in there just fun foley no 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 it was a brilliant <laughs> move I, I was very pleased with it because it gives you that <gasps> yeah in your, in your well i gotta say my favorite storyline i actually agree with alan if i'm looking at the storylines is the werewolf storyline because it for me it was the most in in some sense the most shocking and I love how it ties back in to the principle where he's the guy walking around pretending to be a vampire and and basically stalking and killing people in his through his serial killer actions. And then he runs across her in the Red Riding Hood in the in the woods. And in the way it's filmed, this is another way. This is exactly another example we were talking about, which is she gets attacked you think oh she's gonna get killed by this guy we've seen kill people already and and then the lo and behold the twist is boom red riding hood's cape comes down and it's him and he's like been destroyed he's like <laughs> and just i, I mean i just loved it i loved it. and i was still unclear by the way like what the hell what is she for right. me on the first view i was like what is she is she a vampire 
that's what I thought. And then it did twist again. So it was a lot of fun. That storyline to me is the funnest. Yeah, I thought witches first. Or I, I thought witches too. There was somewhere and I thought, oh, they're in the woods, bonfires. Yeah. You got the Salem effect. It's like witches, maybe. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so was, werewolves was a twist. What was your reaction when it was the principal, when it was Dylan Baker? Oh, that's what that I was like, oh, I, I mean, it was so it felt good. Right. Because yeah. it's another I was, top of a twist on top of a twist. Exactly. I was like, oh, that dude gets his comeuppance. M. Night Shyamalan wishes he could be this clever. <laughs> He wishes he was this. <laughs> Give him credit in six cents. Give him credit in six cents. Some good story. One banger. That's about it. Hey, I'll take a banger. I'll take a banger like that. That's just, all-time cinema classic. That's all-time why, cinema. But why do they keep allowing him to make movies? <laughs> they make money. I actually like. Uh, I liked his his new uh, Glass with James McAvoy. Yeah, I, have you seen that one? No, I heard it was awful though. It was but good. I, I, I liked it. I his acting in that, by the way, is next level. So for me, if you want to take an acting class, go watch that movie. From even if you don't like the story or you think the filmmaking's bad, his acting's unbelievable. Well, he's just fantastic. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah when it was the principal, I was, uh, and and then it was cool to see the reveal, which is like she comes back around and then. They just leave him dying there and <laughs> just like they see he watches and sees all the people they've killed and then he yeah. sees them start to turn and you're like, oh, and all the, it's all the dudes, <laughs> all the dudes that think they're going to get laid. <laughs> so well done. So that to me was the, I think the most well played out, funnest one. Um, I think technically I actually liked the last one with Mr. Krieg. I liked the way it was filmed. It had a very traditional horror vibe to it in its in its structure, you know, where there's one monster chasing one individual. Mm -hmm. And I like that run around and that was a lot of fun. So it had its moment. Little monster too. I like, I like the little monsters. That guy, that's, oh, I love that design and the creepiness yeah. of that scarecrow outfit. Uh, yeah, it had, it, that, that last one, it had its moments, but it didn't, for a climax, it didn't do it for me. It yeah, was I, I agree. I think positionally, it's not in the highest spot. It doesn't yeah. make the most sense. I think yeah. the tie-in is that it's the scarecrow, and we got to tie him into everything somehow. I just that was far more horror cliche. Like as when it comes to cleverness, that is definitely the least clever one of all the stories. Yeah, I agree. I just think from a technical standpoint, right. I thought it was filmed well. It was cool. It had the creepy, we hear it, we don't see it. We hear the footsteps. We don't know where it is. Where's the monster? Where's the villain? We're seeing things through the POV of the, of the subject who's unaware. We're seeing. So, I, I mean, that it is cliche. And I agree with you, but I liked how it was done. I thought it was, it was still, and I don't, I also agree. I don't think it's the best for the, the climax, right? The, the highest payoff. Right. Uh, right. Of, of the movie. I did love when, when little Sam takes off his, his, uh, burlap sack mask and he's got the pumpkin face. That was so cool. Yes. It was just so cool. And then later when he's eating the sucker, like it's just the way that was done. It, it makes that's I'm nostalgic for that kind of stuff. Yeah, for sure. Right in the shape of a weapon, which is was, was kind yeah. of nice. Yeah. I was like, oh, he's just enjoying candy. Oh, shit. No, he's not. He's just shaping it. <laughs> this little fuckers sadistic, man. Yeah, that's what makes it so good. Yeah. Yeah. So um, a, a lot of fun stories here, like a lot of I think like well played. Uh, on the part of the filmmaker uh, being able to tie all this fun stuff together. I, I'm coming up with a segment for this for this month called With a Knife to Your Throat. How about a sucker to your throat? No. <laughs> no. It's the month. It's not one movie. Okay. We're not singling out one movie. With a knife, with a knife, like a Michael Myers butcher knife to your throat. Okay. And this is going to be so hard for Brandon. And that's why I think it's going to be fun. It's going to be tough for him. With a knife to your throat, top five horror movies of all time. You have one minute okay. before, the, before the knife takes over. Pet Cemetery. Ooh. Um, original Psycho. Ooh. Um, He's impressed with me already. First Scream. First, okay. Um, Slither and 
Ooh. Oh, I got it. I got it. I got it. On the spot. He's struggling. He was doing so good. He was doing so good. Well, I was I'm impressed. Debating, I'm debating between two. And he went silent in, in an audio format. All right. I will do. Come on. You got it. Just give us both. You got 10 seconds. Uh, uh, hostile. And um, no, we'll say we'll, we'll say that. Okay. Hostile. He got five. Alan, read him back. I saw you writing them down. Read them back to us. What are Brandon's top five horror movies? We, I know you were put on the spot. So are these in order or are these just oh, no order? Point. <laughs> order. Okay. Pet Cemetery, Psycho, Scream, Slither, and Hostel. Okay. Here's Alan, as our official horror con um, aficionado, where do you uh, position yourself with Brandon's selections? It's not bad. It's not bad. I, I had... didn't think it was bad either. I was very, I, Brandon, I'm not going to lie to you. I was like, he's never going to get five. I'm, I'm a, a little. The Muppet movie. Uh, <laughs> I'm Muppet, little, Muppet uh, Christmas Carol. Uh, <laughs> I, I mean, mine are pretty by the numbers, and you you were really thinking out of the box there. Uh, Psycho, I love that. That's a good that's, selection. That's a good pick, man. I'm I'm kind of going over my list, and I'm thinking where can I swap Psycho in somewhere? But that's good, man. Good job. That is really good. Nice work. I Thank mean, you. there's a couple questionables in there for me. Um, one that I actually haven't seen. So I can't. Uh, I haven't Slither. seen Slither. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't seen Slither either. James Gunn, baby. Yeah. I'm not saying I don't want to. I just, I, I can't speak to it. So I don't know. But yeah, that's something to look into for sure. Fantastic, fantastic practical effects. Not I've much. heard nothing but amazing things about Slither. So yeah. it's one of the, it's on my list for sure. Good job, Brandon. I'm that is pretty good. That is pretty good. I was impressed. Um, you, you definitely went the other way than I thought I was going to go. I thought we were going to have one minute of silence. Close there for a minute. We almost had 10 seconds. Of as silence. soon as I started pushing the knife closer, he started really ripping them off. <laughs> yeah, that's all you got to do. All right. Okay, well, Alan, with a knife to your throat, part. top five horror movies of all time. You Damn have it. one minute. Okay. Uh, mine, I'm not going out on a limb really on any of these. These are pretty by the numbers, and I'm a little embarrassed by it. The first, and this is probably the only one in order Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Hands down, best horror movie ever made. Uh, Halloween, The Exorcist, because I think it was such an important film. This one might be a little controversial. It definitely will be. People either love or hate this movie. And it's The Blair Witch Project, just because I think it jump-started a genre. It did scare the shit out of me when I saw it. It still does. I watch it every year. It still scares me. And Nightmare on Elm Street. So mine are not surprising. Those are pretty by the numbers stuff. I wouldn't have thought Blair Witch, but I'll uh, I, I saw it at Sundance too. Did you see it? Is that what you? No, yeah. I didn't see it at Sundance. I saw it when it was first released, though. Yeah, I did too. I saw it. We did a podcast on it actually, Alan. Alan, I and Todd actually. Todd from the grave. Yeah, that's um, right. yeah, I saw that, and they when at that point they had done such a good job of uh, marketing it as actually found footage during the film like we didn't know it was fake. yeah the marketing the surrounding that part. yeah absolutely and we did a podcast on it we talked for like 30 minutes about how phenomenal the marketing was and it, it also when you're a product of your time in other words the internet's new things are moving in that direction you're able to market it and campaign it uh well, yeah and all i mean you know people are really nostalgic for 80s horror and 80s stuff and i know I say this all the time, but I lived in the 80s. It was a terrible decade. It's the best time of the world. Fashion and music. So people this is where Alan and I differ. We'll fight yeah. for days. The 80s is the best, dude. It's so good. But people will apologize for, um, not apologize, but they'll rationalize uh, liking awful things just because they're kind of nostalgic for the 80s. This is kind of my, the, the found footage is kind of my thing because the Blair Witch Project scared the shit out of me. And it, it, it made me love found footage, even though I know most found footage is garbage. I still love it because it, it harkens back to the Blair Witch Project. Yeah, no, it's good. It's a, it's a good movie. And, and I think that because, and it's also original, right? So it's like nothing had been seen like that before. And now we've become jaded. Like we see, we know what that is now. Right. And so they were, they were revolutionary that way for sure. Definitely. All right, Gabe, let's hear yours. 
with a knife to your throat, you have one minute. Top five horror movies. We know we're going Nightmare on Elm Street. The original, right? Yep. And I actually agree with Alan. I'm throwing TCM in there because that original Texas Chainsaw is phenomenal. I'm going to throw you for a curveball here. And I was talking to a friend of mine and he gave me some of his list and I actually concurred with his Jaws. No, oh, good one. Nice. I know that's, uh, I think, I think that fits and I think that's it makes movie. sense to me. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> this one, I don't know that it's, I, I, it's, it came to mind, Alan, and it's so new and we did a podcast on it and it's always stuck with me. And I don't know if it's in the top five, but I'm going to throw it in there for now was Bone Tomahawk. Oh, yes. Dude, when I saw that, I was like, hold oh. that. That's a, such a different movie. Like the way they westernized it, they made it an, an era piece. Like, I don't know. There was something about that that, that I loved. I, I want to say Halloween because it's so, I know that's traditional. So I'm going to go Halloween, 1978, yeah. 1978. It's a good list. That's a very good list. Jaws. Yeah, I, mean, I mean, there's some, there's some, but I, I, Bone Tomahawk's probably my outlier on that list. If you were looking at traditional horror films, you know what I mean? Yep. Uh, but that's such a good movie. It's such a good movie. So it, it, that really is. And it stuck, it stuck with me. And I hadn't seen it. When we did that podcast, I was like, oh, shit, that is, oh, what just happened? What did I just watch, dude? Yeah. <laughs> have you seen that, Brennan? I have not. I just, I just looked it up. Uh, so Kurt Russell, Patrick Wilson. You should watch it. It's fantastic. Gabe loves well, for historians out there. I'll throw in a six, seven. We'll go. This is, uh, uh, the, the cabinet of Dr. Caligari and Nosferatu <laughs> Good call. filmmaking historians, right? We want to throw that in just for, just for, uh, being pioneers in some sense of like, Hey, we're going to start making scary shit. You know yeah. what I mean? Yep, exactly. Uh, so that's, that's the list. Yeah. yeah Brandon. I'm more impressed with your guys's list than mine. <laughs> That's a sad commentary on the horror aficionado of the podcast. <laughs> I'm jealous. You guys have some good choices there. Or that's just, you have such a love for horror. You're like, man, I love all those movies you just yeah, mentioned. It's kind of, yeah, <laughs> I would have put all of, every single uh, movie that was listed except Slither because I haven't seen it on that list. I know this is trick or treat. I got to ask you real quick, Alan, for Horror Month. What's your thoughts? Have you seen Night of the Living Dead, the original 68 version? I what almost, are your thoughts on that movie? I almost put that on there just okay. because, again, it... it it's revolutionary, right? It's got, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah. Zombies were much different before that, but it's, it doesn't hold up as well, but it's still like right. another nostalgia movie, man. Like I watch it every Halloween. My okay. daughter watches it, you know, it's, it's just outstanding. I have the zombie girl tattooed on my arm. Like it's such an important film. So it was like, it barely missed the cut. I have uh yeah. So I had that on there. And then also, of course, what do we, what, what's our thoughts on Friday the 13th? The, either the original or are we just kind of, franchising that out for what it is um yeah i mean it, it's to me there's nothing real special about it. and i know a lot of people love it but it to me it's just it's pretty by the number stuff i kind of like the first one though and i haven't seen them all admittedly i haven't seen all the friday the 13th but i kind of like the first one because it reverts back to the psycho mom right right like she's cool. the mom's crazy do you know right. what i mean yeah and i mean so it, that's that's kind of like a reverse psycho yeah. yeah, you know where the kid, you know. So I don't know. There's some something there in the story that I liked. I think about that. Well, and they did. You know, they they managed to because it was a total Halloween knockoff. Like right. they totally they saw what Halloween did, and there were tons of those knockoffs at the time, that like prom night and and Valentine's Day or whatever, my bloody Valentine. And there's just a ton of those like April Fool's Day, all these crazy holiday movies. And so they try they they purposely did it as a money grab but somehow they spawned it into a very successful franchise. Okay, well, let's get back to Trick or Treat by Michael Darty. Uh, that was a fun little segment. I just wanted to try something new. I'm gonna do another one next week too, and we'll do another with, your, with a knife to your throat, and then it'll be something. Brandon, give me your quick sum summary on uh, Trick or Treat and your rating. Right. And don't forget, you have to have a, a prop, and you gotta go to the 10th degree. You can't be 7.0. Oh, yeah. You got to be, give me a, or you, I guess you can do 7.0. You just can't oh, say no, 7. Yeah, okay, 7. Okay, copy that. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. Overall, it was, of the of the genre of horror, I, I enjoyed that more than most of the night that, I, that I've watched. And again, I, 
I had seen it years ago, and it's almost like I'd seen it in a way that Gabe kind of saw it because I I don't know that I sat down and watched it because a lot of scenes look familiar. I didn't remember the werewolves at all. I definitely remembered the bus, and I definitely remembered um, the uh, the little or scarecrow head dude. I would give this one seven point five chubby fingers. <laughs> <laughs> Flash dog treats. Nice. I like it. All right. Brandon comes in with a that's a pretty decent score. Seven point five is in a higher know. Richter scale. I am I'm very impressed. Wow. Alan, where are you at? Summary and rating for you on trick or treat. Love it. Love it. The only I mean it's not even a qualm, but I just think the they didn't stick the landing. I think maybe if they would have put the Brian Cox segment in somewhere else, or maybe even got rid of it altogether. I don't know despite how no no you can't get rid of that you can't get rid of that i agree with the position you can't get rid of that come on when he takes off the burlap sack and he's the pumpkin head that you you said it yourself that is great maybe not maybe not get rid of it rework it a little bit i I will say this alan i can can you agree with this they could have shortened it and then gave length to other segments because that last one's real long it is it's it's too long for nothing really happening I mean, it's it's a it's a typical Halloween like chasing through the house kind of scary thing, which is fun. But I I agree, it goes on a little too long. But I mean, I'm 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 just nitpicking, man. I love this movie. It's so much fun. It this is a rewatch every year without a doubt. Uh, it has to be done. I'm giving it eight point one tainted candy bars. <laughs> I like that tainted eight point one coming in with some love real it. some real powerhouse ratings there. Well, let's take a quick look. We got IMDb at 6.8, 6.8 on IMDb. And then if you look at uh, Rotten Tomatoes, Rotten Tomatoes comes in at uh, on. Oh, and then my Internet just died. Anyone have the Rotten Tomatoes? 83% from the critics and 71% from the audience. Really? 71. I feel like it. Does that feel low? I feel like that feels low. I would have expected it to be flipped. Yeah, me too. Yeah, I'm going to come in on the higher Richter scale here. This was a fun movie, totally rewatchable. Um, I don't really, to be honest, have a lot of qualms about it. And I like what Alan said, which is, look, this is not meant to be overanalyzed and overlooked into. This is a fun movie. And so much of it we didn't even cover in this yeah. podcast, just because there's so many cool things happening. And I had a good time watching this. This felt like, man, October 1st lands, I'm going to start watching Trick or Treat. Like, I'm going to go yeah. check this movie out and get into the mood for for the month. Um, yeah, so. every year, on that point, I'll just say every year when it gets around Halloween time, there's, I want I want to watch something that will get me right into the mood. And this is like, I've been looking for a movie just like this to, to throw in there, and I think this is it. And I, and I like that it is... And Alan has also mentioned this, but I agree, which is like, I like that it's, it's funny. Like it's not over. I mean, there's a few moments that are like with the kids and the bullying and you're like, oh, that's pretty serious stuff. But like mostly it's fun and, and, and Halloween-y, right? And, and, and maybe that's the one thing at the end, Alan, that can save it is that it's a little bit, I can't be cheesy, right. uh, you know, where the hand crawls up and, <laughs> and crawls up and reattaches itself and does all and waves and does all that like that's kind of fun stuff and and for what this and the pumpkin seeds that are all in the burlap and it rejoins to the hand and stuff or the body so i really like this movie i thought this was a fun cool uh fun cool movie and i hadn't seen it and and just seen little segments of it or just remembered little segments so i'm gonna come in i'm actually going higher than alan on this one no surprise, no surprise there, though. I mean, I'm a higher rater than Alan is. Um, yeah, I'm coming in 8.4. Pumpkin suckers. Shape right. to kill. It is written down in the brown book. 8.4. So. I didn't even recognize Brian Cox. I had to see. I what? I didn't realize it was him till the credits, to be honest. Oh, yeah. interesting. Really? Yeah. yeah. I mean, he like it's like he had prosthetics or something on. Well, I also he, think if he didn't have the wheezy voice, you probably would have recognized him a lot easier too. And yeah. I also, you know what it is, Brandon, and you uh, should know, it's his it's his long hair. The long hair throws me off too, because I don't see him with long hair often. No. 
So True. that that was part of it as well. Well, on the second watching, I recognized him more. But like the first watching, I was like, oh, like wait. if you went and cut your hair right now, I'd be like, who's this guy? Well, that might be happening. Oh, really? You're going to cut your hair? We already had this discussion. Keep it on, dude. I don't know. Don't cut it. Keep going. Keep going. All right. This ends. This is uh, the Tame Aperture podcast. We have uh, posted our Halloween 2018 podcast. Go check it out on Spotify and all other streaming platforms. Uh, we finally got one posted, Alan. We finally got one posted. Nice. It's only taken six months. Um, but I had to. I had to get it up there for Halloween. It was you, uh, I mean, perfect timing for the new one coming out. It, too. Exactly. That's coming out Friday. Are you on a? Are you hitting that movie on Friday, Alan? It might. I, I told Jess it might be the first time I go back to a movie theater since COVID hit because this is such an important movie to me that I might have to go back to the theater for. I'll it. be there. I'm going. So I'm gonna go go check it out Friday. Uh, but uh, go listen to the podcast. Maybe get refreshed with uh, Halloween 2018. Get ready for Halloween Kills. This is the Tame Aperture podcast. Go check us out at tameaperture.com and all streaming platforms. For Alan and Brandon, I'm Gabe signing off. The Tame Aperture podcast is produced by Dutch Angle Pictures in association with Studio B Productions. Listen, watch, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, and YouTube.